us give thanks to the Lord our God. We give you thanks, O God, for in the beginning you called light into being, and you set lights in the sky to govern night and day in a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night you led your people into freedom enlighten our darkness by the light of your christ may your word be a lamp to our feet and a light to our path for you are merciful and you love your whole creation and with all your creatures we give you glory through your Son, Jesus Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Our first reading this evening comes from the epistle of James, the third chapter. St. James writes, Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers and sisters, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. For all of us make many mistakes. Anyone who makes no mistakes in speaking is perfect, able to keep the whole body in check with a bridle. But if we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we guide their whole bodies. Or look at ships, though they are so large that it takes strong winds to drive them, yet they are guided by a very small rudder wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great exploits. How great a forest is set ablaze by a small fire. And the tongue is a fire. The tongue is placed among our members as a world of iniquity. It stains the whole body, sets on fire the cycle of nature, and is itself set on fire by hell. For every species of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature, can be tamed and has been tamed by the human species. But no one can tame the tongue, a restless evil full of deadly poison. With it we bless the Lord and Father, and with it, we curse those who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this ought not be so. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh and brackish water? Can a fig tree, my brothers and sisters, yield olives or a grapevine figs? No more can salt water yield fresh. The word of the Lord. Of my evening sad.
Our second reading comes from the epistle of 1 Peter. Now, who will harm you if you are eager to do what is good? But even if you do suffer for doing what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear what they fear, and do not be intimidated. But in your hearts sanctify Christ as Lord. Always be ready to make your defense to anyone who demands from you an accounting for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and reverence. The word of the Lord. That's just to leave you in, anticipating the hymn that we'll sing after the sermon. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Of course, uh, James said, from the same mouth come blessing and cursing. And we're going to talk about both blessing and cursing tonight. Okay. Guys, work on that and get it to work. It was working before worship, so. Let me begin with the story. I uh, told this to a, a couple of shut-ins yesterday. Back when I first came to Springfield, came to Messiah to be a pastor here, we had a clergy meeting, and somehow the discussion got to my hair being white. And I said, well, yes, it, uh, it is white, but I, it runs in my family. My mother went gray early. My sister went gray early. My, one of my older sisters went gray early. My older brother went gray early. I'm going gray early. And a pastor said, um, Oh, I heard it was because of not enough zinc in your diet. And I said, well, that might be true. I don't know if I've ever worried about zinc in my diet, but I'm pretty sure it's hereditary <laughs> in my case. I never thought about it at all. Except two weeks later, Stan calls me from the hospital. He had just had a heart attack. And he said, hey, since I'm in Springfield at the hospital, can you come and see me? I said, oh, sure, Stan. I've got to go up to the hospital and visit somebody later on, and I'll be up to see him. I told Herm, I'm going up to see Stan. So I got there, and I got into Stan's room, and we shared pleasantries. And then Stan said, Dan, I want you to know... I should have never said anything about zinc. <laughs> and I said, well, Stan, it's all right. Didn't bother me a bit. Oh, no, no, I, I want you to know that was just, I was out of place. I should have never said that. And we went back and forth, me going, Stan, no, no, don't worry. So finally I realized Stan wasn't going to be able to deal with this unless I said one thing. So I looked Stan right in the eyes. And I said, Stan, I forgive you. And he goes, oh, thank you. Thank you. That's been bothering me. I said, you're forgiven. Stan said something very careless, and he thought it bothered me, and I don't know why I remember it, but I do. But I do remember the word of forgiveness. We could say a word of blessing 
brought peace to stand. So that brings us to our commandment. Eighth commandment. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. What does this mean? We are to fear and love God so that we do not tell lies about our neighbors, betray or slander them, or destroy their reputations. That's what we're not supposed to do. Here's what we are to do. Instead, we are to come to their defense, speak well of them, and interpret everything they do in the best possible light. Interpret everything they do in the best possible light. Speak well of them. Here's the power of the tongue. It can lift 80 times its weight. It's the strongest muscle in the body. The only thing stronger is something they, that is called the masseter muscle, but it's technically not a muscle because it's also involved with, it also contains bone. And that is the muscle that actually keeps our mouths shut. <laughs> so for the purposes of this sermon, exercise your masseter muscle. <laughs> Keep your mouth shut. You may not have realized this, but we are negatively wired. We are negatively wired. I think I've often said that um, for every positive thing we say in a day, we say 17 negative things. It's because we always know what we don't like, but we don't always know what we like, or do we, we don't always recognize it and say something about it. Here's the interesting thing. They have done uh, recognition and cognition studies where they'll have people look at a face. But before they look, they'll ask them. They, they, the study started out by, they'll first tell the person some negative gossip. And they found that they're able to see an object more clearly faster and remember more detail about an object if they were told something negative. Uh, much more so than when they're told something positive before they look at it. So studies prove that there's something in us that responds more favorably to negative things than to positive things. The tabloids are an example. Do you ever have a moment to stand in line in the grocery store? Aren't those tabloids incredible? <laughs> what they say? But they make millions because they know we like to hear those juicy tidbits, whether they're true or not. Political advertising. Are you tired of it yet this year? I thought that, that uh, Donald Trump said something interesting in his victory speech, his victory celebration last night. Now, please do not take this as an endorsement of Donald Trump. <laughs> but he said something interesting. A reporter asked him, Mr. Trump, what about all those negative ads? especially this particularly negative ad, and he mentioned the ad, and I had never seen the ad, of course, it was running in Michigan. And Donald Trump said, you know, that particular ad, when I first started watching it, I didn't think I liked it. But by the time it finished, I go, I like it. It told it exactly the way it is, and it represented me very well. A piece of negative advertising. But he said, 
It showed the American people who I was, exactly where I stood, that I'm not politically correct, and that I won't take any guff from anyone because I'll be a good leader, which I thought was interesting. He twisted that negative advertising. I guess that's why he keeps winning, right? Norman Rockwell, I showed you a Norman Rockwell last week. Here's another one. Notice up above, this is called gossip. This woman spreading the gossip, the first to spread the gossip, it goes all the way down and comes right back to the woman. Our gossip spreads and it always comes back to us, he's saying. So we know how powerful negative words are. And it doesn't take much of a negative word to often change someone's life, especially a young child's life, to change them. But how about the power of a good word? God called creation into being with his word. God spoke, let there be light, and there was light. Scripture is trying to tell us that word, the word of God, is powerful. When we get to the New Testament, we see that Jesus is the living word of God. Jesus, by his life and teaching and his death spoke to us volumes about who God was. So Jesus is the living word of God. There's creative power in God's word. In the sacraments, those of you that remember your catechisms, remember that when Martin Luther, he answered, asked and answered the, his own question, it's not water in baptism. It's not water only that does something miraculous in us. But it's water with the Word, with the promises, promises of God that bring us cleansing, renewal, hope, and peace, and the confidence that we are children of God. So it's water with the Word, with the promises of God. In Holy Communion, it's not the bread and wine that do these great things. It's not just eating and drinking, says Martin Luther, but it is eating and drinking the bread and wine with these words, given and shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. And it's with that, those words, with that promise, that promise of God, with God's word, Martin Luther says, it gives us exactly what it promises the forgiveness of sins. So it's the Word of God that's emphasized. So God's Word is very creative, bringing good all the time, and it can be very creative in us, the creative power of words. Pastor, I know said that when he was in grade school, he was failing. And his parents, he didn't know until later in his life that his parents knew what was going on and they realized there was something going on in the school he was in. And he was told later that his parents actually moved so that he could go to a different school. And he said when he went to that new school, he got straight A's. And he said it was because a teacher there said, believed in him and said, I believe you can do it. And then 
She made me do it. She believed in me. The creative power of words. I shared with you before a scene out of Cinderella Man. Jim Burdock was the world champion heavyweight boxer for a short period of time. Back in the 30s, this uh, took place in the 30s, the, the movie did. And Russell Crowe is in the movie. How many have seen the movie? A few of you. Great scene. He has an eight-year-old son, Howard. But this is about his 11-year-old son, the oldest, Jay. And the way the scene goes, Russell Crowe, the bo who, who is Jim Burdock, Jim goes, he's trying to, he, he goes out every morning to get work. And whenever he works that day, whatever he gets paid for that day is what he brings home to his family. He buys groceries and, and they can eat. Well, he's out all day long and he gets no work. So he comes home, waves to his son Howard, his daughter says, his daughter Rosie says, Daddy, Daddy, Jay stole. Jay stole. So Jim picks up Rosie and carries her inside and sets her down lovingly and there's May, his wife, standing behind Jay. And he said, what's this? What's this all about? And May said, points to this huge piece of salami that's sitting on the table. Enough to feed the family for a week. It's from the butcher shop, says May. He refuses to say a word about it. Don't you, Jay? Okay, Jim said to Jay. Pick up the meat, be gentle with it, and he marches them down the street, and they walk back into the butcher shop, sets it on the counter, and you can see the exchange where Jim makes Jay apologize and ask for forgiveness. And as they're leaving, they're walking down the street and they're walking side by side, not saying a word. You can just tell Dad is mad and Jay embarrassed probably. And then Jay says, Marty Johnson had to go live with his uncle. His parents couldn't afford to feed him. When, when Jim he hears that, Jim stops dead in his tracks. He falls down on his knees in front of Jay. And he said, Jay, I want you to promise something to me. I want you to promise that you will never steal. We do not steal. Will you promise? And Jay promised. He said, Jay, and I promise that we will never send you away. And then he hugged him, gave him a big, strong hug. And I wonder in that scene, what would have happened if Jay could have never gotten that out? Why he stole that piece of meat? It shows you the power of our tongue for blessing, for being creative, for renewing people's lives. I mean, just think. James says the power of of the tongue, it seems that like it comes from hell, he says. But it can do good too. So here we are. We'll end this sermon. This is a painting, grandfather, fisherman, 
It seems like he's out with his granddaughter. Here's the negative thing I thought of when I look at this picture. She's not dressed warmly enough, right? <laughs> but he looks down at her lovingly. She thinks she's rowing the boat, doesn't she? But who's really rowing the boat? He's got his big, strong arms. And I like that image. It's a good image for us. We often think, oh, God Almighty, I'm working so hard. I'm rowing the boat. I'm in charge. I've got all the power. In reality, God's rowing the boat. He's looking down upon us lovingly and wants us to trust him and use his power and understand it's through his power that he brings healing to us and healing to our relationships and healing when we carelessly use our tongue. By the way, what does James say? Anyone who can control their tongue is perfect. As far as I know, that rules us all out. But healing comes when we rely on the power of God to make our words and even our moments of reconciliation moments that bring life. Amen.
In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. For the health of the creation, for abundant harvests that all may share, and for peaceful times, let us pray to the Lord. For public servants, the government, and those who protect us, for those who work to bring peace, justice, healing, and protection in this and every place, let us pray to the Lord. For those who travel, for those who are sick and suffering, and for those who are in captivity, let us pray to the Lord. For deliverance in the time of affliction, wrath, danger, and need, let us pray to the Lord. For all servants of the church, for this assembly, and for all people who await from the Lord great and abundant mercy, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. O God, from whom come all holy desires, all good counsels, and all just works, give to us, your servants, that peace which the world cannot give, that our hearts may be set to obey your commandments, and also that we, being defended from the fear of our enemies, may live in peace and quietness through Jesus Christ, our Savior, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, God forever. Amen. Amen. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. The peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, keep our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus.